thank you Harvard for, for hosting me and Extension Engine for uh, helping us get this opportunity. A couple clarifications. One, the, the, all those things didn't happen at once. So the beach volleyball was many years ago. <laughs> I was a, a little bit younger, a little bit younger. All right. Um, but yes, I, I have been fortunate enough to be through, been through uh, several acquisitions uh, over the last about 12 years. Uh, well, 15 years now, I keep forgetting that age thing. Uh, so it's been an exciting uh, kind of run. And I've been at different types of startups all the way from cloud to back when ASP was cloud before cloud was cloud, if anyone remembers what application service providers were, uh, to enterprise software. And I couldn't tell you how more excited I am to be in the Internet of Things space. This is what I believe will spark truly a 21st century revol industrial revolution. And if we step back for a second and look at the power of the platform that mobile has brought to us, you know, you hear stories of people that are, you know, in almost abject poverty, you know, shacked up living in basements, but they have that one computer and they were able to learn iOS. And there's one story of someone I read in the paper, uh, this guy in Kentucky who was just in that situation. You know, within three years, he went from that state to having a $3 million company based on a $1.99 download with something as simple as putting text over a picture and saving it and sharing it on Facebook. I mean, that, the power of these types of things to make money and to change people's lives is so prevalent in mobile, but I believe with the Internet of Things and adding in physical products that can interact with anything in our world will actually take that to the next level. So, one thing that I want to definitely get out of the way too, Red Sox are playing game two in the World Series. They won 8-1 yesterday. Right on. So, I will, it's supposed to be a two hour talk. I believe a one hour and 15 right around first pitch is about the right thing. So we'll make sure we all get you know, out there, but we will make sure to take a lot of questions uh, as well. So the foundation for this talk was really around taking some of the experiences that I've had in the startup world and being able to share that with you in the context of the internet of things. A lot of times at Zively, we you know, really have a platform as a service that helps entrepreneurs of all sizes, you know, from an individual all the way up to multinational conglomerates, build these great revolutionary products. But even the large companies and the divisions inside of them don't necessarily know how to take these things to market. They don't understand the process involved with successfully bringing something together. The technology is only one part of that. So we wanted to not only discuss the Internet of Things, but also take you through a journey of how a product can actually be brought to market. So if we think about how the Internet started, right, really wave one was the World Wide Web. Well, after DARPANET, right? So World Wide Web. It's about 350 million PCs annually are still being sold. Now that's on a, about a 12 to 13% decline year over year because tablets taking over the world, right? But once we got to the point where we moved past just connecting PCs, we moved into connecting people. And that's really the mobile and cloud era. You know, now we're seeing about 2.32 billion, billion devices shipping every year, and that is growing you know, by 25 or more percent every single year. You know, the one thing that's got Microsoft scared completely, and I've spent my time there, is the rise of the tablet and the demise of the PC. Now, those two waves are massive and they've changed our lives, but I really believe that it's going to pale in comparison to what is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is supposed to be around 50 billion objects, 50 billion objects by 2020. You have really a, a technology combined with the predecessor technologies in cloud and mobile and sensor technologies and all of those things that have now moved to connecting everything in our world. Everything that you see around you, the chair you're sitting on, the roof around us, the pressure sensors, the humidity, temperature, controlling the doors, lights, energy conservation, water flows in the bathroom, everything around you can literally be connected, controlled, and monitored. And that scares me with the NSA out there, but it's going that way anyway. So, um, in the end of it, we start hearing crazy numbers out there. You know, the 20 billion numbers, you know, pretty big. We start hearing economic impact of 4.5 tr uh, trillion dollars, trillion dollars by 2020. Even Cisco is out there claiming that the economic impact will be 14.4 trillion dollars. 
Well, anything that's actually encroaching on the gross domestic product of the US economy gets me really excited. I bet it's a little bit of hyperbole inside of there, but let's just hope it's 10% you know, of that size. In any case, this will be the largest technology market ever, 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 you know, or so they say. So it's exciting. The use case opportunities for this are really limitless, right? It's not only something that applies to how we build connected products for sale as well. It's really about enterprise solutions also. So not only using things that I can build and sell to somebody else, like the Fitbit and those types of things, but people want to be able to optimize their businesses as well. So being able to create solutions for those companies is a huge market potential as well. Now, the use cases that you can build for, and we'll get into what these mean in a little bit, that is literally limitless. It really is limitless. Now, that's a double-edged sword. Some of the positive is that of the limitless is great. I could build anything my imagination requires. But then on the other side of that, I pick up a blank piece of paper and a pencil, and it's like, what am I going to create, right? So really thinking through some of that will give you some tools that will help you with that as well. Now, some of these use cases can be predict and streamline service and maintenance, optimize the supply chain, access dark data to unlock engagement patterns and things like that. Dark data was a really cool term I just learned. You know, we sit around this room right now, there's really not very many sensors I can see around here. So what am I learning from this room? Until you guys talk to me. <laughs> you know, nothing, right? There's data that is here. It's all around us. We can learn about it, but there's nothing that's here to collect it right now. Imagine that in a retail space. Why do people in Best Buy, and Best Buy just proved this out, why do people when they walk into Best Buy always turn right? They always look right, they always turn right. What's interesting is they just found this out and started based on that very simple usage pattern they detected, putting higher ticket items, more information, putting more uh, modern things on the walls like Skype and those types of things, even though they have a, very little to do with Skype. And it gave a different impression and everything off to the left are more pedantic things like you know, appliances and stuff like that. Just that little bit of data completely changed how Best Buy is perceived and how their products are delivered. Imagine if you could censor up how somebody walks in the store after that. Where do they go? What happens in a retail space like a clothing store? What rounders do they go to first? How often, did, how many actual things do you look through before you go to the next rounder and why? How many things do you try in? How, what's the average of that? All of those things are hidden from us right now, but have a potential to fundamentally change how our businesses work. Asset tracking availability, product activation in general in management, but one of the interesting ones is sales, service, and marketing flow. Because when I actually sell something to somebody, there's a lot more data that's in there than just the sale, than just the transaction. Who did I sell it to? Where did I sell it to? Is there a reason why I can understand that they bought something like that? What about the sales mechanism itself? Can I service that in a, in a particular way that's predictive so I can make sure that that machine continues to run and sell and not fall off the map? And then if I understand the person that's buying something in their pattern, then I could probably market to that person. Right? So all of this data is around us. It is incredibly powerful. Now, we've already been in an M to M use case. There's already machine to machine that's been around there for a long, long time. Now the question is, well, Internet of Things, machine to machine, is that like infrastructure and cloud now? Is it just a marketing term? A little bit, <laughs> yeah, but there are some fundamental differences there. But anything that was really expensive as a case up in the M to M world that cost thousands of dollars, millions, you know, to actually create a solution, we actually have the revolution of the cheap now. Things are actually coming down in price and those use cases can extend to a much larger audience. So now you have the opportunity as entrepreneurs to actually look at those cases that were inaccessible before and just do the same thing at a cheaper price point and sell it and still make money. It's a beautiful thing. So opportunities are really everywhere. You know, as we walk around, you know, there's more than one billion lampposts in the world. You know, yep, they have light and they turn on the light and they turn off the light, right? But what if you could interact with them? What if they could interact with you? You know, we all carry our unique identifier around with us. It's our phone. Does anyone not have a phone? I'm always, I always have to ask that. Does anyone not have a phone? Wow, 
All right. Someone get that lady a phone. There, some, you gotta have more. You gotta have more than one phone. Somebody's got more than one phone. Wait, I have more than one phone. Anyway. <laughs> So this is quickly turning into the digital identity of us. We walk around with this near field communication, all of those things are starting to come up as a technology where we roll into something like this. It could just know who we are. And now we have a way to interact with these things. What are the business opportunities to create these things and to sell them with a billion in the world? And that's just the lamppost. So really, there are so many ways to look at the opportunities here. You know, logistics and delivery, route optimization, those types of things are a massive market. Smart cities, you know, being able to, to conserve oil because I know a parking spot is open for me and exactly where that is. I don't have to drive around for it. Healthcare, limitless, you know, almost in, in healthcare. You know, being able to monitor diabetes patients and their medication or asthma inhalers uh, and where one is in case I need one in an emergency. Uh, where are all the, the crash carts located around a particular hospital? Are they in optimized locations for who actually needs them? I mean, all of these things are possible. Energy consumption, a massive one, especially with green energy, understanding consumption, sustainability, all of these things are opportunities. Um, and certainly fun. You know, there are so many different things that you can wire up in a game situation. We have one customer of ours who actually wired up, you know, the claw game, right? The claw game that you put dollar bills in and it never gives you the stupid squishy toy, right? That one. Well, in a nefarious plot to have a cash tornado in the arcade room, you know, these, and this is our customer. We're not recording this, right? I love you guys. <laughs> but in a nefarious plot for the cash tornado for your kids, they have a gumball machine, 300,000 gumball machines around the U.S. actually, 50,000 of these claw machines, and they actually wired them up so they can say, okay, if the lights flash on, how much money do I actually get in? And by the way, I can instantly recognize that revenue instead of 90 days and having to collect it. And then if I flash in a certain pattern, they have a sensor that detects who walks by, how many times they walk by, how many people, did they stop, how long they stop. You correlate that with how much money. And then if all of a sudden you stop after you don't get the squishy toy and someone, they see the, the pattern of turning, does that gumball machine light turn on and all of a sudden they go over and they get business at the gumball machine. And then when you get the gumball machine, all of a sudden does the next uh, arcade game's light turn on and all of a sudden there's walking around, dropping money. Again, nefarious plot. But it can actually look at usage patterns and actually influence those things. But I have to say it, the Internet of Things is irrelevant. I'm just going to say it. So good night. Go Sox. Thank you for coming. There's food. The food's good. It's really good, actually. All right. So I just went through explaining why the Internet of Things is, is massively relevant, and now I'm saying it's irrelevant. So thank you, no one, for throwing food at me <laughs> you know, at this point. But what I really mean to say is that simply connecting things on the internet is not enough. Simply connecting something is not enough. Now, we run into this with a lot of entrepreneurs that are like, I'm gonna internet connect you know, uh, something and it's going to be great. Okay, that's cool, but what does it do? What's the experience? What is the end result you're really going after? Right? M2M has been here and has done that, has made point solutions, but now Internet of Things is different. Right, first of all, I said earlier, power to the people through the, power of, through the revolution of the cheap. I could go to Radio Shack today and actually get an Arduino board for less than 20 bucks. Oh my God, you know, mini computer connected to the internet, connect sensors, and away we go, wahoo. There's you know, cloud platforms, all these things that can make my products. Awesome. But again, just connecting something isn't enough. You need to create experiences with broad appeal. And we'll look at what experiences mean. But in the end of it, in order to really have an internet of things, things that freely connect, you have to have unfettered access to really allow things to come together easily without a heavy lift to make that happen. So solutions can come together and be meaningful for the people that are using them. Now, today, we seem to have intranets of things on the internet. And that's really kind of the M to M legacy. But the internet of things promises a whole different world for that. So let's look at what that means. So we get snow here. I think it's going to come soon, kind of soon because it's getting cold outside, which as a skier I'm really excited about. But the six foot snow drifts I sometimes get with the nor'easter aren't great. So a snow thrower really helps, not to mention it's a lot of fun. You kind of throw the snow at the dog, freak them out. You know, it's a good time, right? But if I internet connect a snow thrower, so what? So what? On, off, I see where it's gone, I know where it's gone, I put it there. <laughs> you know, I see that it's been through so many duty cycles, the, the um, 
Spark plugs are firing at 700 degrees. What does that even mean? I'm not a snow thrower expert. I just put the thing on and go, right? So a product like that, doomed to fail. We just saw this with a company called Hunter Fans. Actually, they went through a whole internet of things exercise and internet connected their fans. Uh, they had a major infrastructure problem. Boom, they punted their whole IoT stra strategy. They were so traumatized over that. But at the heart of it, fan on, fan off. Okay, maybe, you know, I think it's a little bit better with your heating system, but it didn't really have the legs underneath it. But let's change the perspective on that. What if I wasn't selling an Internet of Things connected, Internet connected snow thrower, but someone like Lowe's or Sears or Home Depot was selling clean, safe driveways during winter? Huh, that's different. That's an experience. That's something I can get behind because I want a clean, safe driveway for my family when I need it. So yes, an internet connected snow thrower is part of that solution, right? But instead of it just telling me directly it's data, which I have no idea what to do with that or what it means, but it connects in through a cloud to the snow thrower experts back at Lowe's or Home Depot. And of course they wear lab coats and stethoscopes, you know, at the snow thrower experts. Stock photos, gotta love it. But they know that if my spark plugs burn at 700 degrees, they're probably starting to misfire. Well, you know what? They're coupled in with a set of storm warnings. That data comes in through Weatherbug, Weather Channel, something like that. Oh, look, Nor'easter's gonna be here in two days. They run a set of analytics that tells them, oh, give me all of the snow throwers that are out of operating specification and why. And let's send an alert out that says, storm alert. You know, storm coming in two days. It looks like your spark plugs are going to misfire or are misfiring. Push a button here to order. Push this button to get a PDF to show you how to change your spark plugs or push here and we'll have somebody come out and actually change them for you. That is a completely different dynamic, right? It is now guaranteeing in a new cooperative that I'm going to have a clean, safe driveway for my family in those two days because I know my snow thrower is working. That is meaningful. I now have a different dynamic between the vendor, the consumer, and the product itself. And now that can become a service that I have instead of just buying a product. That is far more valuable, has a far greater effect, especially with loyalty when it comes to the customers because now it feels like we're in it together. There's a reason why inbound marketing on social media, whoop, hey, come here, uh, there we go. There's a reason why inbound marketing through social media is so powerful. It's because people trust other people who are your friends, or you think you're your friends, <laughs> to tell you about something. If I go out outbound and say, with a sandwich board and go, you know, buy my snow thrower, people are like, whoa, man, take it easy. You know, but if my friend goes, hey, dude, you got to check out the snow thrower, you're like, oh, cool, thanks, right? It's the same thing with this. It gives you this feeling that Sears or Lowe's or Home Depot is in it with me to make sure my family's safe. And the halo effect from that can be huge. What other products can you put out there that you can actually trust and say, I trust this vendor, and they're in it with me? So what I want to challenge you in is to think about things in this dynamic. What is the experience? And how can you have an experience-based thing as you move through the eureka moment? You know, normally I get them in the shower. It's a weird place. You know, I get up in the morning. You know, I think it has something to do with the sleep. You know, you wake up and all of a sudden it's like, I've got an idea. You know, all of a sudden the fireworks go off and the angels start singing. And, you know, it's that great moment. And you're like, sweet, you know. But again, you got to step back and think about what is the experience for that? Not just I'm going to internet connect my bar of soap, <laughs> you know. It's like it could be clean body all day. Who knows? I don't know. So, unfortunately, there's things that look like this <laughs> that actually come after that eureka moment, right? These are, uh, this is an approach to building not only messaging a product, but a business approach to actually take that thing to market. And what we've seen in a lot of the current state of the industry when it comes to Internet of Things, it's a nascent market. It's early on. Um, you have people that are really understand the technology, but may not necessarily understand how to go to market, how to take things to market. You have others that really see the vision from a, a business perspective, and they really know what they can do to get that stuff to market, but they don't really understand how to build it, because IT can't build this. This is a new technology, this is a new thing, right? Now, there are some people that can self-service it, 
um, but they tend to be very small companies, you know, three to five people. Probably a lot of those people are over in that room or in this audience, which is a good thing. But what I want to share today is really how you take that from that idea to market. So the first thing that you really want to go through, I know everyone wants to run out and build, you know, and that's good. You want to go out and start working on those things, and that's great. It teaches you a lot as you go through that process. But the most important thing to start is to really start doing research, understanding what the market and product requirements are. How many of you have heard of a market requirements document, a product requirements document? Okay. They're a very good thing, although they can be really a pain to do and to think through. Because what they do is they make you sit down and understand the use cases and requirements to really make something valuable. It helps you think through that experience. Now, when I come at a market, I always go out and do these kind of things. So, not only do I talk to analysts, I talk to press and read the press and see where the press is actually mainly covering things. Um, I look at current potential markets, do uh, uh, strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats analysis of what my idea is. Look at goals and priorities for what I want to do with this. Look at what customers are out there for my competition, or maybe if I have current customers, what they're doing, and I'm trying to expand my product set. What are the current and past product offerings that have been successful and failed that I've done or have in that space that I'm looking at doing? What events are out there that actually tell me about these things? And then what's really interesting too is looking at where the money's going. Where is venture capital interested in putting its money? So being able to go out and look at not only different angel uh, areas, crowdfunding, looking at the main venture capital portfolios of a wide range of uh, different stage companies, it tells you a lot about where things are going. So the research is critical in really understanding and not just saying in a vacuum, hey, I got a great idea to internet connect my, snow my soap bar, but then just saying, yep, that's a great idea. Keep telling myself that, you know. You need to go out and really litmus test these things. Beyond that, being able to define who your target constituencies are, what the scenarios are, and the issues that they're facing is key. Because that will really uh, hone exactly what you want to build before you get too far down the line. Now, what we have up here is an example one from Zively. This is actually out of our framework document that we did uh, starting back, God, middle of last year for the first product, or next product iteration we did that was out in May. So we went through and looked at all of the different constituencies that are interested in using a platform as a service to accelerate and simplify their Internet of Things innovation. So between consumers and hacktivists and prosumers and commercial product manufacturers, enterprise IT, service providers, solution providers, quota manufacturers, up to vendors, academia, research academia, military government, all of these things, and actually more, we found out, really are interested in what we do. Now, what you don't want to do, though, is sit there and say, let's create something for every single one of those. Because at the end of the day, they can be bucketized into strategic targeting that you can take not only your product, but your messaging and your marketing. So from here, we actually took all of those actual different constituencies, and you can see most of them are here, and we bucketized them into four areas so that we can really hone what our product was going to and what our messaging was going to go to, and that started forming our go-to-market. It also starts informing how we monetize the product, who we want to partner with. So all of this builds from that foundation of research to get you there. So here we have, you know, again, this is working off of Zively's. We have partners, product vendors, enterprise solutions, and developers. Right? Those were the four targets. Now, what's interesting is that developers are certainly in the product vendors, and they certainly are in the enterprise solutions, and they're certainly inside of the partners. Right? But why are they called out separately? Because you have to speak to developers differently. Right? I can't talk to them like a business decision maker. <laughs> They'll never go past the first page of my site, you know, or the first page of the tech part of my site. So it's important to realize not only who you're building for, but how you talk to them and who they are. So from there, you start developing a market-focused roadmap. I can't stress enough the market-focused. Now, a lot of companies that we go into and uh, some of the, su the su successful startups I've been in have been turnarounds. Right? We've gone in, they've gone down a certain product line, they've missed the market, not by a lot, but an inch but in uh, missing the market is a lot. Right? But you go in and make sure that a market-focused and tested roadmap for what you have 
is out there. You've done it, you've researched it based upon all of the underlying work here. Again, work to an MVP. Now what I mean by MVP? Minimum viable product, right? Because guess what? We don't know it all, right? We're not gonna know it all. The second you get out the door, you're gonna learn something new, right? So being able to get out, have something that can be successful in the market, and then iterating on that is important. So it's especially important when we start looking at what everybody's problem in the Internet of Things is, when we start building these things. Now, an end-to-end -end solution you know, takes this, these kinds of steps. You know, starting from left to right, I have to build a smart module and make choices inside of there. What's my platform? ARM Embed versus Arduino versus Raspberry Pi. Is it a microcontroller? Is it a full mini computer? All of these choices are seemingly endless with the thousands of platforms that are out there today. Now, I then roll that into my smart object. The smart object has to have logic inside of it to do something, right? Now, based upon the earlier research that you've done and your market requirements, all of that, you actually have your, a, a blueprint for which you can create a smart object that matches the scenarios and needs of your target constituents. So from there, you have to find a network operator. Now, that's normally if you're doing you know, GSM, 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, Wi-Fi, connected Ethernet. There are all choices out there, right? Again, understanding the market and their needs will give you a good choice there. Uh, it's been a little tough with some of the uh, carriers out there to connect over cellular, but they're starting to come around. Uh, Verizon actually just came out with a, a pretty cool plan for uh, a GSM-based uh, connection model that was down to just a couple bucks a month for a device. But very low data rate, but that's all you need for a lot of these things. So they're starting to come around a little bit. You then have to consider what's the platform, and that's these next three that are actually up here. So between the platform, enabling capabilities, the applications that will come in, building the interfaces themselves, you know, do you use REST, do you use SOAP, what's the security model for it? All of those things have to be built. What platform are you going to place that on? Is it going to be Java? Is it going to be on Rackspace? Is it going to be on Amazon? Hopefully it'll be on Zively. We help with a lot of this. Um, you know, what about the service providing? CRM, billing. All of these things are the realities of what you have to put in to get a product, even a relatively simple product, out into the market. And then, of course, you have to, ha you have to sell it and a user has to buy it. Then they have to activate it, right? So all of these things are required and have to be thought of as you're moving forward. Now, as part of this, we are seeing uh, from our perspective that the IoT is maturing in a particular set of steps. Now, it's not all happening at once, but over the next five years, we are seeing that this is where it's progressing. Over the next two years, we're seeing that, obviously, you've got to connect a product you know, to the internet. Yes, I said that that's not enough alone, but you've got to start there, right? Uh, companies are then realizing the data they are getting is optimizing their businesses. After that, and then we see that after about two years, they realize that all of that data that has helped optimize their business can let them transform their business models. Instead of doing something, buying something, it becomes, insert word, as a service. Everything becomes a service. And that's a completely different model with a completely different revenue stream that actually can be as much as 5x when compared to just selling product. And then the interconnection effect we see is about five years off. The ability to take solutions, two completely orthogonal solutions, and be able to easily and without code or a business arrangement tie them together in a meaningful solution for me and what exactly my needs are is really going to occur and that's when it gets incredibly exciting, even more exciting than it is today. So imagine this world, you know, working with a customer that actually has a, uh, a baby jumper that has a respiration monitor and a, an accelerometer built into the baby jammies, right, in the baby jumper. So if the baby falls over, it registers that, and if it stops breathing for more than a certain amount of time, it texts you. Great. If my kid's having a SIDS level issue, don't text me. <laughs> you know, turn on every fire alarm in my house, right? You know, today that's a big business uh, arrangement because the fire alarm company is not going to make baby jumpers, and the baby jumpers aren't going to make fire alarms, right? So if they want to make that work, well, business development guys start talking, developers start coding, security starts happening, and hey, point in time solution, awesome. You know, that's great. Well, you know what though, if it's 3 a.m. And, and the fire alarms are going off because my baby's having an issue, 
and there's no lights on, I'm probably going to run into the wall and kill myself before I even get there. So I probably want all the lights to come on too. Great. Three-way business development conversation, which we can all, some of us can test in this room, that doesn't always work well. So, and then the same thing. Eventually, imagine a world where I can get to the point where I buy a fire alarm, you know, a set of fire alarms, internet enabled, I buy the baby jammies and I buy a Philips Hue light bulb and I turn around and through a simple little macro, I just go, oh, I know what they all are because I'm at the top of the security chain and I can interconnect those, baby stops breathing for more than five seconds, turn all of these on, done, right? That's the future we have to get to. That's the future we need to think about as entrepreneurs as we start developing these type of products. Now that future can be done with open standards and, and those types of things. That will help, that will shape up over time. But the mentality of, of us as designers coming at these things needs to be that this is the eventual maturity curve and let's be prepared for that. So let's take this through an example, okay? Now I like to call this things the, the IoT primitives. They're the building blocks in which you start to build a solution. Right? And again, we talked earlier about kind of that white piece of paper that says, you know, hey, great, I got a pencil and, all right, write a story. Uh, you know, build a product. Uh, you know, these things can help you think about that. Because again, opportunities everywhere around us. So, some of the primitives include, is it full or is it empty? Somewhere in between. Is it open, is it closed? Is it on, is it off? Is it hot or is it cold? Or somewhere in between. <laughs> What's the rate of flow that it has? What's the pressure? What's its location? What's its use? And can I control it? Most of these things are now controllable, right? So combining these things together can now start to spark imagination to actually get a solution. So a lot of people in the Northeast still have heating oil, right? Up, especially up uh, a little bit of New Hampshire, things like that. And, you know, users got to go check the oil and make sure it's there. And of course, if they see on, you know, Channel 7 News that Nor'easter's coming in two days, what happens? Emergency phone call from the entire region, you know, down to the fuel company and everybody come. Okay, that's not exactly an optimized way to deliver fuel, right? It ends up with unpredictable results. It's insufficient, it's insufficient and difficult to optimize. And oil futures on the market can't really be very predictable. You can go by past data. But you're not really sure, the margin of error could be pretty high. So this is a big opportunity. So if we took the primitive of flow control or a flow, uh, flow rate and full and empty and we combine that as an internet connected solution and we started taking data from that. So I know how full is the tank? What's the rate at which it's used and what seasons? You know, that data can be captured to the internet fairly simply and it's not a lot of data. So now what you get is centralized monitoring of a whole area set of heating oil. So you can start doing consumption analytics and you can say, well, if it's a colder winter, how often do they use their, their fuel? How fast does it go out? What's their overall fuel limit? So then you can start saying things like, well, I can get predictive about my delivery pattern because if I know a storm's coming and averages under 25 degrees, that this person uses you know, X amount of gallons per day, the storm's supposed to only last two days, their, uh, their tank is half full, that's enough for seven days, they're fine, I don't have to touch them, let me get to the other customers that actually need that heating oil who are outside of those parameters to actually make it through that storm, right? So, of course, you're still gonna get the calls. <laughs> you know, I need my oil. No, don't worry, we, we got it, you're cool. All right, you know, it reassures the customer. But then you can start to optimize the business because now you can start tying in things like the weather pattern. And you can start knowing not only what's that weather coming, what it's gonna be like, but historically what it's been like and what the flow rate has been like for an, a for an area. The Almanac says for this winter that we're gonna get hammered. Again, I'm a skier, I can't wait, <laughs> you know. But what does that mean when, compared to two years ago when it was incredibly light winter, right? What was the consumption rate? What was all of that? You know, and the Farmer's Almanac's not exactly an internet-connected thing. Well, it kind of is, but I don't think you're really going to do spot pricing based on that. But there are a lot of other things in historical data that will help you through predictive analytics understand truly how I can optimize my rate, what my real consumption is going to be. That allows me to optimize my supply chain. It allows me to use less. What happens to heating oil during the summer? goes bad sometimes. So I got to clean that out. That's wasted money, right? So the optimization of that business is huge. But at the same time now, the customer no longer has to buy gallons of oil as needed. 
This becomes fuel as a service. The customer doesn't have to worry about it. It's almost like electricity. Now to use, this is how much I pay. Natural gas already has this. What's my rate? I have it, I just pay it. And you can actually normalize your bill as well now with natural gas. You know, and just pay about the same amount over the 12 months instead of a really high bill or a higher bill during the winter months and none during the summer, right? Now you can do that with heating oil and that's something that has to be delivered. So that can completely transform how the business model works. But now, even more exciting is more for the end user. So we actually have a customer that's working with us that has a, that's a restaurant chain, has 400 sites, and they use 5,000 liter tanks for fuel. Now this is for propane, so it's a little about our heating oil example, but they still have to deliver the propane to those tanks, right? Now, before, the fuel company often came in and underfilled the tanks by about 10% roughly, and they had, and, but they still charged a full amount to that customer. The cost is about $10,000 a site a year in fuel overcharge, right? It's a decent amount of money, right? But so the restaurant chain replaced the mechanical propane tank gauges with internet connected gauges and a monitoring service. The tanks are now completely refilled because they know they're watching, completely refilled twice a week. The savings at $10,000 uh, a year over 400 sites is $4 million a year for that chain. I mean, that's an incredible amount of money for a pretty simple change, right? Now think about that as entrepreneurs. What if you could come to a restaurant chain and say, hey, $4 million, I see that you have 400, uh, 400 uh, restaurants in your chain. I bet you they're underfilling your tanks. You go out, do a quick reading. Literally, there are sonar sensors that you just, you know, on the side of the tank and bing, boom. I know how much you're full or empty. Yeah, just leave that on the back of the tank next time they fill up. Yep, 10% short. My solution will turn around and save you $4 million a year. Pay me $1 million. <laughs> but the ROI is there, right? It saves them money. It's a money-making opportunity for you as well. Everybody wins. Sustainability wins. It's all a win-win. I hate cliche. But so, if you take it to the next level, right, the interconnection effect can have a profound effect on this over, overall. So instead of now a uh, heating oils futures buyer sitting on the market doing spot trading, instead of just kind of guessing and seeing what the data kind of looked like and you know, maybe off as much as 15, 20% in that pricing, he can now have an accurate picture and be predictive about where those things are, the consumption of that, and actually get a much lower margin of error on actually doing the spot pricing. So now everybody wins on that. You know, he's going to make a better, uh, more money because he's more accurate on that and all the puts calls, all the stuff they do with that. But then the customer wins out on that because their contracts are more accurate. They're paying less money. So now that data comes together and not only is the customer winning, the vendor's winning. People are using less money. Some people are making a little bit of that, that savings in, in return for that. And now, you know, I use less oil and I know exactly what I need to use. So sustainability wins and conservation wins. Right? Together, looking at this cycle and thinking about it in these terms and building products in these terms with experiences in mind is what will actually drive these outcomes, not just internet connecting something. They're powerful outcomes. So, we go back to our example. We've built our market-focused roadmap and are starting to build our minimum viable product. You know, the next step is really, how are we going to take this to market? What, how are we going to monetize it? And who are the partners that are going to help us with this? So, first of all, in go-to-market planning, you know, the, I can't stress enough how much stealth is your friend. <laughs> you know, I've, I've seen uh, some companies, luckily I haven't been involved with them except for one. Actually, uh, we have Janice here who's on my team as well, Neocleus. The guy was out talking about uh, the product that's going to change the world, literally banging his shoe on a, on a freaking desk, you know, Khrushchev style or something. Uh, and he hadn't even built it yet. It's like, <laughs> come on, dude. <laughs> you know, I think others will notice. It's a great idea. But so, uh, you know, of course, there were competition that came up with that. It caused problems for him. But stealth is your friend. Only talk to people that you think can help you. NDAs are great. You're not going to be able to do that with a venture capital company. But, you know, make sure that you keep it quiet. <laughs> you know, get the information you need, but don't trumpet it until it's time. Build pressure. That's what you want to be able to do and then have that pop when you come out in the market. We'll look at that in a moment. 
So when you're going to market, remember that a line of business, the application typically, is the profit center. They don't have to actually do bake-offs if they don't want to typically. They can, in an enterprise, they can say, yep, I'm making the money, I want that. They don't have to do some sort of RFP or anything like that in a lot of cases. They control the purse strings because they're the profit center. However, ops ends up being a cost center, right? So they're the data center guys. So when you go to a data center guy and say, oh, well, we want to put this in, that's great. Let's bake it off against these five things. And of course, six months later, congratulations, you win. Now here's Rocco, the procurement agent, <laughs> that's going to come over and work you over. No, but wait, I got ROI. He doesn't know ROI. <laughs> you know, it's like Rocco just wants the extra like five points because Rocco ends up getting uh, incentivized and bonused on how much he saves. Every point he saves off of a deal goes back to his bonus, right? So it's much better to deal with the line of business if you can, as opposed to ops. Now there is money obviously to be made in ops, but it's just something to be aware of when you're doing go-to-market planning. And then determine your route to market. Now there's a lot of different ways to get to market and some of these combine together. Now they're not the only ways inside of here, but these are a lot of the ones I've dealt with. There's some other ones you can come up with as well. So OEMs, you know, being white labeled into a particular solution. That's what Zively actually does. So we get baked in as the infrastructure. You don't even see it's us, except on the box you'll see you know, Zively capable, right? Um, direct sale, so you gotta hire a sales force or do e-com, that sort of stuff. Uh, solution selling, where you actually sell the solution itself and you go out and help through a consulting uh, exercise build a solution that includes your product. Um, or go through a channel. Actually, Citrix Systems, you know, $10.6 billion company, actually they just got hammered the other week though, um, they ended up with a whole channel solution and they grew from, you know, literally 30 people to $10.6 billion company, you know, pretty quickly by just selling through the channel. It's a heavy lift a lot of times, a lot of faith, and you got to put a lot of skin in that game, but it is possible to do that. Now, a lot of these times, these things can be combined together, right? You can be an OEM solution that sells through a channel. You can sell through a value-added reseller. You can do solution sales with a systems integrator. Again, these are opportunities for you to look and see how, what really is the best way to take your product to market. Now, monetization is how do I actually price something and make sure not only do I have the budget and the runway to get to profitability and make sure that I can actually go forward, but at the same time, I understand the true cost of what I'm bringing to the market and for funding, when if I'm going for funding, I know what I need to ask for. So you need to understand the true cost of your service. And that's just not, well, it's this piece of plastic part and this little Arduino part and, you know, this service. It's, you know, what's the head count? What's the load on the head count? It's your whole profit and loss and budget projected out 18 months. Right? That's normally how I go about 18 months, two years, even though that will fluctuate but you gotta do a best effort to understand that, right? And then you have to understand the real market potential. The real market potential and the price points. Because I've heard enough times people go, well, it's a trillion dollar market. If I capture just half a percent, that's $50 million. Woohoo! let's go, you know. <laughs> yeah, easy cowboy. You know, it's like, hold on. You know, a lot of times venture capital companies we'll see right through that if you're going for funding. They're like, yeah, 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 no. What's the true market of what you actually have? You know, uh, one of the uh, angel companies I'm looking at uh, or working with, sporting goods company, as you heard I played volleyball, came up with a, a sporting sleeve that actually protective medical compression has some, some padding on it. And uh, my buddy the other day talked to me and said, hey, well we can, you know, the volleyball is the number one or two sport in the world and we'll sell it all over the place and we'll get this. He started like going down his path. I'm like, whoa, time out. You know, we don't have the budget to market worldwide. We have the budget to market in the US. You just cut, cut off 70% of the market. You know, we're starting there. So let's back off the budget projections and let's work off a realistic place that we can go. So adding that realism into that will save you a lot of headache down the road because you're gonna you know, be conservative in your numbering. Understand that. And then really understand, are you a Vicodin or are you a vitamin? Now, these are two really important things, and I'm not just talking about on a Saturday night and a Sunday morning, right? I don't know how you guys party. But uh, so, a Vicodin is something that's solving pain. It's solving pain for you today. People who have pain need a solution. The pricing for that's very different than if it's a vitamin. If it's a vitamin, it's just something, ah, it'll help me learn, un understand a little bit more, and that's cool. But the first things that go during uh, tough economic times are the vitamins. The things that always sell 
and seem to be recession proof is Vicodin. Right? How powerful is your solution? What pain does it solve? This also goes back to that beginning research. You know, uh, one uh, consultant I, I had worked with around messaging and talked about, take, talk to your customers, put out these scenarios, understand them, and put them into the pain coat. You know, sharp glass and make them roll around in their pain so they feel it and they tell you what it's like and empathize with them. And then you build your solution, your message to solve that pain. And then you've got them on the hook, right? Again, a little nefarious selling technique. But anyway, the point is that if you can solve pain, it's worth more. So understand that about your solution as well. And remember, price is market and product specific. You may have the greatest consumer product in the world, but if your competition doesn't get above 100 bucks, you're not gonna sell it for 500, right? You may be able to, it's gonna be a tougher hoe, but if it's 100 bucks, maybe sell for 199. You have to really understand those aspects of the market. Again, Vicodin or Vitamin really helps with that as well. Now, partners are an interesting thing because you really want to choose strategic partners. Of course, you're all thinking, duh, of course you want to have strategic partners, right? But not all partners are the same, and not all partner integrations are the same, right? Now, we have a good partnership with Extension Engine. You know, they're going to do design for us. We're going to give them, you know, a, a great platform to do it on. It's going to be a win-win uh, scenario together, and we already have prospects on that. That's great. But then there are other partners out there that have Barney deals, right? How many of you heard of Barney deals, right? No Barney is, right? The purple dinosaur. I love you, you love me. You know, a Barney deal is just a press release that has no meat. It's like, oh great, I love you, I love you too. And then it just goes away, right? So it's great in the press, I can put it on a website, fine. You know, that's okay. Uh, they have their, their purposes sometimes as well. But if you're coming up with a new product, a new service, you want to try and focus on things that will really propel you going forward. Now as part of that, small company plus small company partnerships equal little return. You know, it's just, it, it's unfortunate. You know, I've, I've had a, in the earlier days, I'm like, yeah, this other startup's got a great idea. Together we can take this solution. You know, unfortunately, a wiser mind looked at me and just went, yeah, no, but they don't reach anybody. You know, you want to spend dollars and time? Time's precious when you're in a startup. I don't sleep as much as it is, let alone in startups. You know, none of us do. So do you want to put it with another small company that can't really propel you? You know, really what you want to do is partner with people. You know, you want to build to go public, but you want to partner with someone who can acquire you as well. Now, you don't build for acquisition. I really believe those days are, are gone, right? Because you just do things so strangely, you know, to, to be able to do that. If you build a solid company going forward to go public, then you have something that is the most attractive state for someone to acquire you if you want to go that path. Right? Now, I've been through, what, six acquisitions now? I'm telling you, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nice moments in there, that's for sure. But, you know, what if you're Benioff and you sold out for $100 million? You know what Benioff made this year, or this last year? $106 million. <laughs> He's, you know, a multi-billionaire. Zuckerberg, his uh, pay for this year, because uh, uh, Facebook went public, $2.3 billion. <laughs> awesome, you know? That, there are choices there, right? It's hard to pass up, you know, what, Softricity was $237 million. It's hard to look at and go, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. But it's, every situation is different. So once you understand, wait, where are we? Sorry, I went forward. So understanding about looking for synergies is really important in larger partners, but the most important concept is surfing their wave. So for us right now, Log Me In uh, is about a $785 million market cap. We're public on the NASDAQ, Log M. Check it out, it's great. Stock more than doubled 10 months. It's been pretty good, pretty good so far. But you look at us, we, we are a drop in the bucket compared to Salesforce, to Microsoft, to Cisco, right? Right now, you know, my marketing budget, better than when I was with startups, but at the same time, I have to do more with less. Now, Cisco is coming at this pretty hard with something called the Internet of Everything. So Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, um, God, what's the GE's uh, industrial internet? Pick your marketing term du jour, it's just more stuff on the internet, right? But they're putting, they all want to capture it because they know the size of this market. So Cisco just dumped $100 million in marketing into this internet of everything. It's only 5% of the actual search term, 70.1% is actually internet of things, but hey, okay, you gotta try, 100 million will buy a lot. 
They just put $200 million into a consulting organization. Do you know what Cisco has right now in the internet of everything? Uh, nothing. <laughs> they don't have anything right now. But they're coming, believe me, they're coming hard. They'll, they'll come out in uh, about March or something like that. But anyway, the point is, they have a tsunami wave of $100 million of marketing. You know what? And I've got enough of a board to actually ride that wave, to take marketing and ride in with it and find ways so that when I get into a story, it's, oh, the Internet of Things players, Cisco, GE, and Zively. And I can do that for something that's a seven, you know, a million dollar budget, not a hundred million dollar budget, because they're making that wave happen. It's almost as good as having that budget, eh, to some extent, by just being mentioned inside of that line, right? I get the cred for that. We just got, uh, our PR company ended up getting us into uh, BBC Newsnight, right? Newsnight's like the Anderson Cooper kind of equivalent uh, inside of uh, the UK, right? They did a whole you know, eight minute expose and there's the CTO of Cisco UK and the CTO of McAfee talking about it. And there's me, <laughs> you know, I'm like, exactly, hi. And, you know, it's the VP of products and strategy, you know, for a company that's, you know, a thousandth the size of what these guys are, right? So being able to pick your partners, finding the right spots, finding the right synergies, getting in ways and speaking languages and being a thought leader that can get you to surf those waves also gets you noticed and you can take advantage of those things. Surfing the waves, look for those. So then, once you get through that kind of strategy, then you have to learn how to talk about it. How are you gonna talk in the market about these solutions that makes you sound different? You can't say the same things. Everybody, you ought to say some of the same things, but you gotta say them differently. You gotta make people you know, look at you and go, oh, wow, cool, I, oh, you did that? Oh, wow, that's different. And even the best is, what the hell is that? because then they're still gonna come and try and find out what you're talking about. If it's, the worst thing can be something incredibly vanilla, where it's just like, oh yeah, I know what that is. No one's coming to your site then, you know? No one's gonna spend minutes on your site for that, right? So with that in mind, the way that we approach, and I say we because Janice and I have been uh, working together, what, 12 years, 13 years now? And this is how we've worked both in small companies, uh, in Microsoft, this is how we did uh, the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack. We sold a company called Softristy, which, which pioneered application virtualization. We were down on Congress Street back when, you know, that's where certain people got the good drugs. <laughs> it was like it's a militarized zone down there. Now it's all like the seaport and everything. It's kind of a, a really hip place. Thank God, because we're back down there working again. But, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, or Softristy acquired us because we went through these types of processes and we're talking about something very differently. It's not just management of apps. It was the ability to actually have apps anywhere you need them, instantly on demand, and they wouldn't break anything starting talking about things in a much different way. So we go through things by, remember, we did the research before that said, what's our target segment? Who are we going after? But now we need to understand what are the benefits by that target segment. Each of those, what are they looking for? What's their scenarios and issues we know, but what benefits do we give that are unique and how do we speak about those things in a different way that not only gets them to go, that's interesting, but cock their head and then want to learn more. That rolls up into what we call the messaging pillars. Te technically, there's four of them, or typically there's four of them. There can be three. They're the legs of the stool for your value proposition. They talk about, you know, I always like to, we always like to use uh, the first one that tells about more about what you do. The next one tells about the next great step you can take. The third one talks about the ROI. And then the fourth one is the mountain of a vision, the dream that sits there and goes, wow, part your hair back. And you either get people that go, wow, I want to take that ride, you know, that's great. Or they step back and go, no way, I'll debate you on it. And then eventually they come back around. I love the debate. <laughs> you know? But if you streamline it that way and talk about things differently, then when you build a value proposition, people will care. They'll get something that says, not only will I solve your solution as a f or, or give you a, a solution for your problem as a first step right now, but then you'll want to take that ride with me because the rest of that shows this vision that 15 years from now, they're going to look back when you're CEO of the company and go, that guy had vision. He, that's the point he's the one, that, or she's the one, that, tran that uh, transformed this company. Right? And that gets people hooked. The toughest part of this is trying to get it into 100 words, and then into 50 words, and then into 25 words, and then bring a value proposition out that's very succinct. I think uh, Janice, I, and uh, probably about uh, five, six different people in the different teams over time have all wrestled around and pulled each other's hair out over single words. It really comes down to that sometimes. 
Um, we all get beers afterwards, so it's fine. Um, but then once you get past that positioning statement that really rings true, that you can say to somebody in an elevator, they get what you want, what, what you mean. And then you get to the tagline, you know, four or five words that really succinctly brings it together. You start from the bottom and you work up. But when you tell the story, you work from the top and move down. And right? so when you build the website, you know, whatever your, your uh, name is, the tagline, position statement, value proposition. And that's how you start. I can't stress to you how important this is and how overlooked this is in a lot of companies. People are so cool, you know, especially product driven companies, they jump out and go feature list, see, check, 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 check. You know, it's like, wait a minute, that's not value. Those are features, right? Let's talk value because that's what people want. What's the experience? What's the effect on their business or their lives? Talk about it in that way, it's a bit different and you'll hook them. Now, beyond that, you then start coming up with your marketing campaigns. There's only two, two, two boxes left, we're almost there. So, you know, marketing strategy for me, you know, I kind of like to be a little animated. I think we all got that because I really believe that if you build companies, you get customers. But if you build cults, you get believers. Apple, cult, <laughs> you know, right up until Steve Jobs passed, unfortunately, right? That guy could command a room. People believed in the power of Jobs. He got up there. He showed you some cool stuff. You believed in him. You believed his vision, right? You have the cult of Apple, right? Everyone believes that Apple's just decimating Windows in business, right? <laughs> it's still 86%, you know, Windows out there. But you, you talk to people and they're like, Apple's killing them. You know, it's like, yeah, they're killing them in, you know, in, uh, in uh, tablet sales, and yeah, they're killing them in marketing and perception. The reality is Microsoft's still the juggernaut, you know. But anyway, thinking about that, being able to drive awareness on your terms, being a thought leader, being out there and talking about these things in a passionate way. We should all be passionate about what we do, about our products. These are our startups that we're talking about. These are our babies that we want to share, right? Inspiring your market. Right now, not all of us have that, right? But we can find ways through messaging, the messaging exercise to really understand how can we be inspirational about how we talk about things. And then feeding, all of that will feed the organic engine. One of the top ways to get noticed is through uh, SEO and inbound uh, search optimization. Right now, you do that, and I'll show you a little trick on that one, but you do that and you start getting that through getting your message out through being inspirational, speaking about things differently and surfing other people's waves and that builds your pipeline, right? So I really believe in what I like to call agile marketing because the best laid plans die the second they meet the market. So you may have great marketing, you're ready to roll forward and you put it out there, but you gotta watch, ever vigilant. You know, watch your Twitter feed, watch your competition, watch all of them and know where it's going. How are the analysts talking about it? Is it completely different than what you're talking about? Not from a I'm different, and people will start to get it and come to me? Or am I so out there that it's just not resonating? Be agile. Think about the, how I can actually change that and react to market conditions. Differentiated content is just key. You know, you can't put out stuff with just a different logo on it. People will not care, right? They'll come out and go, eh, great. You know, more stats. You know, the Internet of Things is gonna be $1.2 trillion. Who cares, right? You've gotta talk about it differently. Right? right now, Zively is the only one talking about interconnection as a way to empower the Internet of Things. Right? That's something we consciously sat down and saw in the market that that's what we wanted to talk about because everyone's talking about MTAM on the Internet pretty much. So we're talking about what's in the future. Now we solve your immediate problem, but we're talking about it in a differentiated way. Now, social omnipresence, you know, be godlike in your social, <laughs> you know, but really between Twitter, Facebook, you know, Pinterest is of interest now, pun intended. Uh, and then um, Google Plus, eh, a little bit behind there. Twitter's number one, you know, far and away. Doing, you know, if you can spend some budget on promoted tweets, promoted accounts, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. We just spent 15 grand. That's it, 15 grand and a quarter on a promoted account. We ended up going from 4,900 uh, Twitter followers to over 33,000 in less than two months actually. Now the actual reach I have with that is over 5.6 million impressions. The second I send out one tweet on something, right? And the second that they retweet that, that exponentially jumps, right? That's the power of an inbound strategy. But your social for not a lot of money can really give you a lot of that power and reach a large audience. Omnipresence means including physical 
Remember the original social? You actually walked up to talk to somebody, all right? That's the original social. That's the best way, that's the best social. Get out there, talk to people, hand, you know, glad hand. Don't be fake, right? Be honest about what you are. If something does something for someone, great. Be proud about it, talk to them. If it doesn't, then tell them, hey, you know, good luck to you. Hopefully we'll find a solution or look over here for something. I wish you the best of luck. I gotta stop messing with my, my thing here. Being out there in a physical presence, being in events, talking about those things, very important. And then I use something I like to call the leadership flywheel. And it might be pretty standard, but it seems to work you know, fairly well for us. Hello. There we go. So it all starts at the top with a differentiated message. What is different about your product? What is the value that you're bringing? What is the business value, the personal value? How is it gonna change somebody? How is it gonna solve their problem today? And then how is it going to give them something that is visionary after that, right? Start with a differentiated message. That goes from things as simple as blogs all the way up to how you discuss it, your messaging frameworks, all of those things. The message must be different. Look at how other people are talking about it. Talk about the kind of the same things, but twist it in a way that makes people go, wow, that is different. Uh, we put out press releases around those differentiated messages. We happen to be putting out, God, we're putting out three next week alone. I mean, it's been pretty crazy. I'm surprised you're still awake, you know, but actually I'm surprised all of you are still awake, but hey, you know, we're trying. But so uh, the press release is important around the differentiated message. We always put out some sort of thought leadership blog whenever we put out a press release because I don't want that opportunity to go out without, the, without us having a chance to talk about things differently. How are we looking at these things? Why is whoever did a press, re press release with us coming to us and talking to us? Right? Well, let's put out a thought leadership blog and make people think. Take advantage of that. Right? We like to do video. Uh, a lot of the video is very short. I mean, it's amazing the attention span of, of, uh, of everyone these days. Thank you, MTV. Uh, it, sends, it seems to be about a minute and a half. Minute and a half, then you start losing people. Right? So building a video that's quick cut, get your message across, but is referenced throughout all of these things, and then certainly through the social engagement, all the way out through Twitter, talking about these things, that wheel starts to spin. And then you start spinning that wheel enough times with enough messages, enough blogs, enough uh, press releases, all of those things, then it starts spinning and your attention starts to grow very, very quickly. I never want to, for us, we never want to put out something that's the same, it sounds like everybody else. We never want to put out something that doesn't have that blog twist to it. Then the routes that you actually can go, hello. There we go. So some of the marketing channels, I won't go through all of this, but the four main ones, paid, earned, owned, and social. If you actually think of each of these properties, you know, something in social is obviously you want to put out and say, hey man, check this out, and hopefully get somebody to start telling people, hey friend, you need to check this out. Right? Again, putting that out. Uh, earned is when someone notices that and wants to do a piece on you. The BBC coming to us had noticed something we did on a, a program called the Internet of School Things. So it was a hub we had put out there where kids could not only learn in the UK and in schools, could not only uh, learn their curriculums through Internet of School thing or Internet of Things devices, which is pretty cool for them, but they could also be taught how to make their own little Arduino things, their own little ARM embed things, and attach it into the system. So not only are they learning in a fun way, but they're learning skills that will actually allow them to be empowered for the next great wave of the digital economy, which is the Internet of Things. So we had, uh, BBC found that, did a whole piece on Internet of Things. Actually, I think we just posted that uh, tonight. Great piece, you know, but we earned that. And then the owned properties, you know, uh, our website, things like that. And then paid media, things like banners, that's more outbound types of things. We're more, we're about a 70-30 shop inside of, for us, 30% outbound, 70% inbound. Um, but these four areas working in concert is how you really bring those messages out. And again, spin that wheel through them and get your attention. So now, once we've gone through the marketing campaign, start thinking about funding. God, funding's fun, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, the way that, uh, I mean, I've been through 42 rounds. 42 rounds. It's amazing that I have, you know, just a little bit of gray hair I have, really, and I'm still alive. Because a lot of times it's the same redundant pitch, same questions, all of those things. And you hear a lot of no's. 
And you hear a lot of people that put term sheets in front of you that's like, you want 70% of the company for $100,000? I mean, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a little crazy sometimes what people will do. But there's some things that can help you along that path. The first is get educated. Got to get educated on what funding means. What does pre-money mean? What does post-money mean? What's around? <laughs> what's, you know, what's pro rata? I mean, we start going down these terms. You have to understand what those mean, what funding terms mean, what you're looking for, what a good deal is, and understand that before you start going anywhere. Now, there are people that can help you with that. You know, hopefully there's you know, people you understand through Harvard. I'm sure there's some money people in Harvard <laughs> you know, that you can have connections around that can help you understand some of those terms. But learning how the actual funding vehicles work is really important. Bootstrap as long as possible. I can't, that's one of the top two advices I can give you for funding. Make sure you bootstrap as long as possible because at some point you have to price the valuation of the company, you have to price the company. If you have a PowerPoint and you know, someone that waves their arm around a lot, it's gonna be a much cheaper price and a lot higher price for capital than if you actually have something that's ready to go to beta or you have something that has a couple customers. That is a much higher value. You can get more people, more term sheets competing against each other. You can play them against each other and actually get better terms. Um, a pitch deck is a must. Now a pitch deck, I know it seems pretty simple and pretty obvious, but a pitch deck is important. Not only does it get across your ideas, but it helps you think through how you actually want to pitch the funding. So a sample pitch deck that I use a lot of times is what's the team? What's the problem statement? What's the market opportunity? Realistically research your market, by the way. Remember, it's not 5% of a trillion, you know, 0.5% of a trillion dollars. No VC will believe that. No incredible angel will believe that. What are the current solutions? Why don't those solutions solve the problem? What's your solution, why it's different? Go to market plans, potential partners, because they'll see that as potential exits. And then funding amount, what you need, what it will get them, right? That's important. If I give you a million dollars, you know, ah, cool, you're gonna get me a new Porsche and uh, I'm gonna have a bunch of dinners and maybe uh, you'll get a, a, a prototype, yeah, no. Right? You need to tell them, well, we expect to get this to get to beta, we expect it to be ready for this, those types of things. And then what will get them then, of course, your conclusion. What really gets funded, it's in this order. It's team, it's the dream, and it's the potential. The first thing they look at is who are they investing in? Who are you? Now, you don't have to be anybody. You just have to be competent and credible and come across as knowing what your business is. That's why the research parts of this process are so important. Because if they start asking you questions, and believe me, they ask you the most inane questions out there. They start drilling down. You know, you've got to have answers for that. Even if it may not be completely the right answer, or eventually you have a good explanation about where to look, but you'll say you, you know where to look and you'll go get the answer, that's fine too. But you've got to be credible and understand how to answer these things. The dream, where's it going? Right? This is what it solves today, but that's the hill before the mountain, you know. This is where everything is going. Take this ride and you'll see the next Facebook, you know. I wouldn't quite go that far, but you turn around and actually see the potential. At Softricity, nobody was looking for or Googling, uh, you know, a solution that delivers applications anywhere you need them at any time across the universe, right? They actually needed, strangely enough, in financial services, and particularly Morgan Stanley, that started it all off, they needed to run Excel 97, next to Excel 2000, next to Excel XP. That's what they needed because the plugins in all three of those wouldn't work with the other versions. So they ended up having three terminal server sessions to try and have three versions of Excel working so that they can make it work. Incredibly cost inefficient. You know, we came in with a solution that said, I'll solve that problem for you right now. Our first major deal, it was like our third deal period, our first major deal, 50,000 seats, $125 a seat. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. That set the company, right? That set the company. Because then we went up and down Wall Street you know, with that solution and everybody bought that. You know what Microsoft sells that solution for now? $5 a seat a year. Do you know what their revenue is on that in the last six years? $4.79 billion. Crazy, right? So Microsoft, and that's the power of Microsoft, right? $5 solution, but we were able to sell it for a buck 25 because we talked about it differently, because we had a vision, and eventually they would see, look, if I did it with just and solve this Excel problem, which I could get recognized right now, here's the vision, or eventually all the apps in my area, no matter what computer I went to, were instantly available for me. Right. 
talking about it differently, selling it, that vision is important. But that dream is what you sell next. And then the potential. How much money can you possibly, realistically, conservatively make out of this if it goes forward? And I don't mean by an exit. It, nobody wants to hear, well, we'll go public. Well, we'll go sell it out for, you don't talk about any of that. You just talk about what is the potential over the next five, six years if you have a reasonable run rate in a well spec market. Right? That goes further for credibility than anything. So funding routes, there are more funding routes than this, but the main four ones that I pretty much see out there, self-funding, let me tell you, this is the best option. <laughs> you, know, you don't want a board if you don't need a board of directors because it's kind of a pain. <laughs> you know, and a lot of times with the CEO is dealing with the board. Now, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. A lot of boards can be very good because there are things in, you know, that venture capital companies can do for you that sit on your board. There are strategic people you bring on your board that can help you. At Softricity, we had uh, a guy who was the COO of Adobe. <laughs> that was pretty nice. We all, and he was also, uh, I forget what the other one was. And then we had another guy who was uh, a vice president out, uh, or senior vice president out of HP. That was a great one. You know, there are reasons to bring people in. But the farther you can go self-funding, the more you're going to de-risk the actual investment. That's an important thing because investment is about risk. Yes, greater risk, yes, greater return, but there's a point at which it tips. You know, if it's just something crazy and you know, people aren't gonna invest in it, right? So you wanna take it as far as you can to that beta, first customer stage. Self-funding will get you there. You'll get a much better valuation for your company if you can do that. Yes, it hurts. You know, if you don't have the money to do it and you scrape and you know, noodle it up. Uh, what, what's the noodles they, they have in college? I can't even remember now. Thank you, ramen. You ramen it up, you know, you put a little tuna in and some soy sauce. It's wonderful. I did that for a long time. But you know, you, you, do have, you do that, the payoff will come down the road. It's important because every time you take that extra dollar too soon, that's an exponential amount of money down the line that you have to give back, that you're giving up in the percentage of your company. There's seed and angel people. Now there are people that actually do individual angel funding so that will uh, fund, you know, two or three angels act like a venture capital in smaller checks, you know, 500 grand, 750 million, depends on, you know, how, how rich it is. You know, Ellison's out there dropping, you know, three, five million dollars of stuff as an angel. He can do that, right? But a lot of times you have groups of companies that come together, uh, like tech stars, stuff like that, that you can apply to. They'll take a little bit of your company and they'll give you, well, more than a little bit, and they'll give you money as an angel. Or there's actually a vehicle called subscription funding which is a really interesting vehicle. So instead of having just a few people, you end up having a minimum uh, investment, 25, 30K, something like that, depends on uh, you know, what the investment is and all of that. And you turn around and get as many people as it takes to fulfill that round for that, part that particular percentage of the company. Um, I'm involved in a company called Newbury Port Brewing Company. Has anyone heard of Newbury Port Brewing Company? Yes, all right. One, two, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, their Greenhead IPA is awesome. Anyway, so these guys started out with a subscription funding. They wanted just 850 grand, and it was a 25K minimum, you know, and you could put in more than 25K. And, you know, nice little funding. These guys oversubscribed to 1.2 million. You know, they were looking to actually hit about a 1.6 million uh, in bookings run rate the first year. They hit it in the first six months, you know, which was awesome. So now they're doing a discounted convertible note as a second round. I'm actually doubling down inside of that as well. But we ended up having in the capitalization table, I think there's 52, 56 investors, something like that in that first round. Everyone gets to get a piece of that. You know, that's great. Now it's great from an investor's perspective, but the best part for Newburyport, those guys aren't on their board. <laughs> you know, it's just money, here you go. Now some of us are working with them on their board so that you know, they, have, they can pick and choose and you know, leverage those people to go forward. But it's a great way to actually, a great vehicle to go forward as well in an angel seed round. There's crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is awesome. How many of you heard of Indiegogo Kickstarter, right? Awesome stuff. Turns around and gives you, you know, money and I have to just give you a t-shirt <laughs> you know, or the first version of my product. Sweet. There's no board member there either, you know. Again, not to be too down on board members. Again, they, they're positive. They have their place, all of that. They're great. But, uh, you know, crowdfunding is a great way for the right projects, and certainly Internet of Things qualifies for those projects to be able to get money, you know, pretty relatively small money. Some can actually get up to a million, something that I have seen that, uh, and get going very quickly without a lot of return that you have to provide. And then, of course, there's venture capital. And traditional venture capital can range, you know, anywhere from, 
uh, you know, you're an uh, entrepreneur in residence, they pay you a salary while you're working on something, they get a piece of the company as they fund you and you spin out, all the way to A round companies, B, B round, C round, D or mezzanine round companies. You just gotta pick the right company at the right time. Some are really good for tech, some are not. Some are really good at the very early stages. Others, you know, come on, just give you money, don't really do a lot for you. Others do a lot for you, you know, as well when they sit on your board, but you have to research and know they are, right? But again, this is something that you wanna get an advisor and help with that. Reach out to networks and understand who can help you in this realm. Now, a really cool thing in crowdfunding though, because I just read literally today, I cut and paste this, that it looks like the SEC is going to change rules for crowdfunding because today it's illegal to give a piece of the company for that money through a crowdfunding site. So it looks like they're gonna change that rule so Kickstarter will end up giving a piece of the company, an ownership of the company out to you for whatever you put in. That's interesting, good and bad, right? I have access to some things I might not have been able to access to as an investor, but on the other side, what's the fraud gonna be like? You know, what's gonna happen? Because it's normally in an altruistic type of thing like Kickstarter is, you know, it's self-policing. But now when real money starts coming in, you know, who knows? It'll be interesting to see how that actually shakes out, but that is a change that's coming. So, there is help. You know, there's all sorts of help. Between tech enablement, hardware platforms are out there, ARM's got them, um, Aconis, TST, Arduino, you go down the list, you know, you can go out and get those today. Platforms, certainly AWS, Salesforce, Zora for billing. There's a million SaaS companies that can help you. Sively, you know, takes out 70% of that infrastructure for your connected products. We do that for you right now. We actually had a customer uh, spent 12 weeks trying to do it on Amazon for their infrastructure. Could barely get it to work. They stumbled across us one day. One day, connecting their basic prototype up. You know, so you can have an effect. Um, mobile, big data analytics, tying those things together. Consulting is out there to help you between designers, extension engine, Great place to come and actually learn about how these things work and they can help you get things built. You know, trusted partner of ours. Uh, system integrators. Then incubation and funding between Kickstarters, as we talked about, EIR programs, Techstars, different accelerators that are out there, build a bolts out there, they're around this area. Telcos are starting to change now to actually support some of these models. Well, one telco has one support model. It's slow, it'll come. Contract manufacturing out of China can help you, certainly support for product and services out of those companies can help you as well. There is help for you out there. Look around for that, seek help. So at the end, execute. That's the fun part, right? Let's roll. Run hard, run fast, have fun. Hopefully not die young, <laughs> you know, but you know, get out there, do it. It's going to not be easy. It is not easy, you know. You don't sleep a lot. But you know what, hopefully you wake up in the morning and you're like, wow, this is mine. I get to go out and talk about this. I get, this is something that I get to hopefully go change the world with. It's exciting. All the best laid plans, boom! <laughs> the second they hit the market, I'm sorry. You know, uh, was it, uh, God, what is his name? Von Mulkey, there you go. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right? It's, it's very true, right? The second you put something out there, it will change. That's why I'm a big fan of business strategy and not business plans. Because the second a business plan gets out there, it's gonna change, right? Have a strategy, have a direction you wanna go to, but be agile in everything you do. Um, don't be afraid to fail. You know, you fail, hey, all right, that's okay. That's fine, learn from it. It's one of the most important things you can do. Now, if you've done your research and you followed kind of the chain that we showed, the failure won't hurt as bad but everyone's gonna fail. You know, it's okay, pick yourself up. It's how you address that failure, how you come together, how you iterate, pivot, iterate, pivot, keep going. And I can't say enough that the people that you bring into the business, you know, if at all possible, trust. Try and earn that, have that feeling, and work with them. Pick them up when they're down. There's nothing worse than when things come down, and you know, again, I come back to Softricity. We were within one paycheck, one paycheck of closing the doors. Now, everybody else in the company didn't really know that, but in the Zec team, we knew that. And we had to get a bridge loan. But we kept battling term sheets, all of that, and literally we were down, we were holding bills and all of that. And finally, the bridge loan came in and that saved us. And then we, that got us to our last round, and then Microsoft picked us up. Imagine if we didn't have that. But a lot of us, you know, tense, tense times, right? Everything we've been working for, oh my gosh. You know, the, the, the main reaction is to start, well, what are you doing, what are you doing? You know, pick each other up. Right? It, it's hard to do, but if you do it and you work as a team, 
it's a far better experience and the outcomes are far better. And then be the high priest of your own cult, right? Again, you build companies, you get customers, you build cults, you get religion. And religion is what drives people to believe in you even when the chips are down, right? Be out there, be passionate, have people, inspire people. Let, and then you'll be uh, surprised at how many people will actually follow you if you can do that. So Patton, you know, a good plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan next week. You know, now I don't want you to go out there and violently execute you know, your business plans. But uh, you know, the point is that it's not always going to be perfect. When you feel that you get to market, you have that minimum viable product, get there. Go do it. Get out. And then see what doesn't work. See what does work. Iterate, pivot, iterate. Keep moving forward. So in conclusion, you know, I, I love the quotes, you know, leaders are made, they are not born. They are made by hard effort, which is the price which all of us must pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. All of the things that I'm showing you inside of this path is not easy. They're necessary. It's almost the minimum to actually really move things forward in a lot of ways, except if you made angry birds, okay? <laughs> That's different, I'm sorry. But Realize that anything that you're going to build is going to require this amount of love, this amount of tension, this amount of effort, and you know, sweat, blood, and tears moving this thing forward. But if you do, you do it, and it's successful, or even if it fails, you're going to have an amazing experience that you'll not only learn from, but you're going to take it to the next one, do it even better, and I guarantee there will be a point that you will have that success, and you can say, I did it, and I did it from the ground up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think, uh, I think we're opening up for some questions. Or? Yeah, I think there's a couple questions open. So if there are any questions, uh, we can walk around and uh, ask those questions. If anybody's got any. Oh, there's a question. Hey, Chad. Hi, Bob. Um, <laughs> so I, my favorite uh, uh, quote about the, um, the planning one is Mike Tyson, that everyone has a plan until they get hit. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, I thought that was... Uh, Made me laugh. Um, can you give me an example of, of either a crowdsourced or a uh, an early stage, uh, you know, Internet of Things? Some, what's what's happening at the at the front lines of of the, of the market right now? Because there's, there's got to be hundreds of cool stories, and I just, you know, I'm excited to, you know, there is. But the socks threw their first pitch out, you know. <laughs> no, exactly. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We actually, it's eight, no, we got time. It's <laughs> eight eight oh seven. Oh wait a second. All right. Not to duck your question. <laughs> so the question, uh, you know how many cool stories are out there in a, in a crowdfunding way. So one that's really, really interesting is called Canary that I've seen. Actually, there's a couple ones, but one is Canary. Canary is an air quality monitor, uh, smoke detector, um, what else do they do? A carbon monoxide detector, fire detector. Uh, they're a uh, sentry as well with a camera, sound detector, and uh, infrared at night as well. And literally all you do is you take this thing out of the box, connect it to your Wi-Fi, you know, and then plug it in in the corner. It also has a siren on the thing. So literally from your phone, you have a complete security system, home uh, protection system, excuse me, all in one very simply connected thing right on your smartphone or your tablet or your PC. That went to, to crowdfunding, and that, I believe, was only looking for around 200 grand. They went over a million. You know, boom, like that. 60-day Kickstarter, right? Now, there's no upper limit, typically, on Kickstarter. It's just time. You know, so you turn around and you end up having, you know, that amount of money come in. Now that company is off and running, right? Another really cool one actually is on a much smaller scale. 13-year-old girl had a really cool idea where, you know, she misses her dog, you know, and she wanted a way to be able to take her smartphone, talk to her dog, and give her dog a cookie, right? And it turns out her dog's a Bernese Mountain Dog. I have a Bernese Mountain Dog, so instantly I love this Kickstarter, right? The video was awesome. But so what she came up with, with the help of her father, you know, uh, who was a, a double E, they came up with a little system that basically put an iPod touch with FaceTime and built some software on that onto a little cookie dispenser and you know, had a little speaker on top of it as well so that she could turn around, put it on, and say, you know, my dog's name's McAllen. I love scotch. So he's like, McAllen, you know, come here. The dog would come up, lick the phone, you know, and he could drop a cookie, you know, good girl. So if you're away, you know, I travel a lot, you're able to very easily reward your dog, your dog can see you, and hey, cool, you know, and still have that connection with your dog. They feel good, you feel good, everybody feels good, right? That Kickstarter ended up starting out, I think they only wanted something like 10 grand. You know, they ended up uh, with over, I think it was $132,000 for that thing. You know, and it's the most basic Internet of Things thing, right? But it's amazing, a 13-year-old girl came up with that. 
You know, that's awesome. By the way, I'm a big fan of kids because kids' minds are really, you know, unfettered by all the, you know, the, the junk that we've had shoved in there over time that narrows our thinking in a lot of ways. They don't have that. They're just like, ah, oh, look at that. I'm like, wow, that's brilliant. You must be a genius. No, it's been there all the time. It's just, we just overlook simple things that kids just see, right? So, I mean, I love, I love that story as well. Um, but there are other ones that, you know, we've seen that are outside the crowdsourcing that are going for more traditional venture, which are kind of interesting. One uh, is a company that, um, if you look at hospitals and hospice care, uh, you end up having um, intravenous drug pumps so that you can actually have automated delivery of drugs uh, and a nurse can you know, magnify her presence through technology. Unfortunately, the electromechanical pumps inside those things started sticking, started killing people. Back in about 2010, FDA came in and put a moratorium on them. So the nurse had to go walk to where the pump is and actually watch it work. That kind of kills the whole point of the pump, right, the remote pump. So a company came in, looked at that as a platform, created a pneumatic air-based system to replace that electrical me mechanical pump, tied it to something called an electric imp board, actually used our technology to remote connect that as well. They went into clinical trials. Those guys went from 45 nursing incidences a week with those pumps to zero, 100% efficacy, right? And they did that over about a two-week trial. So incredible, right? Existing platforms, simple change, right? Internet connected, and it's solving a huge problem. They're on a fast track with the FDA now for approval, which means, okay, eight years instead of 20, <laughs> you know? But, but anyway, but these things are, are real, right? The funding that they're going to get, they've got people lined up for them. You know, they're not even sure what their valuation is gonna be yet, you know, on top of that. But the terms will be really good because it works, right? They got past that bootstrap process. Any other questions? The, the big numbers that you start out with on segmentation are, are on the market size. Um, the segmentation, like, how do you think about segmenting the IoT? You know, wearables, home, industrial. Like, what are the keep big, going? <laughs> what, are, what are what are the big buckets? And and w you know, if if you wanted to get smart on those, you know, who are the thought leaders in those those categories? Where would you send us and the people here to go, you know, um, in addition to, you know, your <coughs> <Zively. and> fly, <coughs> and your flywheel, where, you know, who do you, who do you guys see as the thought leaders and who do you right. look to as your sort of colleagues when you're sitting on top of this, you know, flywheel? So there's, there's a lot of uh, people that are out there talking about this. Uh, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of great stuff that's out there. I think one of the best places to start is a place called Postscapes. Com. So Postscapes actually takes all things IoT and collects it together between all sorts of different sources, between product companies, their blogs, between analysts, researchers, all of those things and brings them together in a pretty cool way to go searching and talk to them. Machina Research is doing a lot of stuff on this constellation. Uh, Andy was just here uh, earlier doing great stuff on that. Um, Gartner Forrester all has good information, IDC. Uh, Cisco is putting out a lot of uh, really good information around it right now because they're pumping up their own internet of everything. Um, but at the same time, the, the data that's coming out is, is really good. So the buckets are, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of them, right? You know, there's industrial, light industrial, um, you know, uh, quantified self, uh, you know, medical, um, oil and gas. Uh, I mean, literally, you could go on and on and on. I think the spectrum that I've seen is probably 25 to 30, but literally you can start breaking that down into thousands. Well, right now, we're seeing a lot of traction in light industrial which is pretty good. Um, so anything that is uh, you know, turning on and off pumps, right? You think back to the primitives, right? To turning on and off pumps, you know, looking at our doors open and close and, and for when deliveries come in and things like that. You know, all of those, those areas are really good. Oil and gas is actually red hot, you know, I think in this area also. Um, and that's really from an enterprise type solution. Of course, home automation, you know, is a big one. We do believe that consumer home automation ends up being kind of a race to the bottom because there's so many people doing it, you know, and you have big players like Xfinity and ADP and all that coming into it. So the margins are gonna be lower, but you know, hey, it's still a huge broad market out there. Um, you know, we view that uh, even our competition, which our main competition is do it yourself on Amazon, but you know, with people like Cisco coming, all of that, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. It's a trillion dollar market, it's great. You know, if you don't have any competitors, be afraid, <laughs> right? You may want to litmus test your idea, <laughs> you know. But uh, it, you could be out ahead of the market, you never know. But um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's a pretty wide spectrum.
Cool. Yes? Well, it depends on, so the question is, is the connectivity reliable enough? It just depends on what the use case is, right? So if I end up having something that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, what was it in Homeland? You know, you had uh, the guy's, uh, the vice president's um, pacemaker was internet connected and uh, Brody interrupted it and they killed the vice president. That was a little scary. But uh, hopefully that the connection wasn't that, uh, wasn't that uh, reliable, that would have been better. But no, so it depends on the, on the solution, right? So you have, uh, we're working with one, with Notre Dame, who actually has, you know, Notre Dame, boo, you know, lower, lower institution, uh, that ends up having a, um, a, a solar farm in Uganda, right? So the solar farm has these tracking modules that are, you know, regulating how much energy is coming out, they're, they're tracking all of those things, how, what's the temperature of the actual panel, all that sort of stuff. The only problem is trying to get that information all the way from Uganda is, is very difficult, right? So they end up having a storage that's local and then they have someone come and collect as they can inside of that to get the resolution to an intermediary, and then you come in and get your data off of that. Right. So I guess part of what the, uh, when you said the FDA thing with the, the pneumatic pump, and right. is that actually going up to the internet and then down to some other monitor? It space? is, so right. So the security, and part of what we do is secure that end to end. But if you think about it in design, mm -hmm. it's not, you don't want to design something that says, okay, I'm going to push the button on you know, on the laptop, and then it's going to send a signal and say, okay, pour, 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 or inject, 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 stop. Because if something happens and this thing sticks in an injection point, that's not good, right? Mm -hmm. But what you would do is send the command down to it and say, this is the, the prescription I'm going to give at this time, and it programs it locally. So there is, the communication is out of the, the critical path at that point. And then it says, okay, at this time I've met my schedule, now do it, and it has all the safeguards on the local system that's redundant. So it just depends on, on how you design it, what the case is. You know, and some of these things aren't fit for just regular internet stuff, even if it is secured quite yet. Um, there will be, they will have closed networks, some of them like ATM networks, stuff like that. And they're starting to come out on the internet, but they're still pretty much closed loop systems, things like that. There are certain cases the internet of things just won't be that great for, for a while. Okay. Cool? Great. Yes, in the back? So, uh, in this space, uh, there are so many players. How is Zively differentiating? <clears throat> and second, uh, you said stealth your strategy until you have done the groundwork. Uh, moving forward, um, how do you protect that? Or do you, do you think you have taken enough of consideration to make sure that uh, your competitors don't jump in after six months and execute that? Yeah, so, uh, I'm sorry, how does Zively differentiate itself? Uh, first of all, is uh, so as a division of LogMeIn, LogMeIn has a cloud that we own the brick and mortar data centers of this cloud. We've owned them for 11 years. We've done nothing but connect devices. Uh, smart tablets as they rose, uh, PCs, users, data. We use uh, an infrastructure called Gravity that actually takes those seven data centers and is a combination of an infrastructure as a service and a platform as a service that all of our things are written on. So this whole next extrapolation of the Internet of Things is just, you know, much smaller computers that can either do you know a little bit less or do a little bit more or the same thing right so we already understand how to deal with that so we acquired a company uh, called patch bay some of you might call it pachubi <laughs> phc p-a-c-h-u-b-e and a, another brilliant fit of bad naming even though i love usman hawk who was their start of their founder but uh you know uh, we bought that company it was right on the edge originally they are they were a let's bring all these devices together make that really easy and then I'll open source the data Right, so you can turn around and freely open and freely use that data. You know, well, we found that after it got acquired, and then we came out with a beta named Cosm, that people wanted to build products on it. So we took all those requirements in over an eight-month beta, and based on our platform, built that into it. So now, you know, we think we've cracked the code on supporting literally the thousands of platforms that are out there, the you know, millions of gateways, the billions of phones. We can support that, normalize it through an API, and have an app easily, you know, interact with it. Any app, web service, you know, smart tablet, PC, whatever. Right, so that, that crux of the middle part where I put on that, you know, everyone's problem, we solve 70% of that problem. You know, like I said before, it's, and we do it in a way that's not just, oh look, I've got this, you know, uh, messaging system up on the internet on, and I ran it up onto Amazon, great. You know, and look, things are working, right? No way to scale that, no way to secure that. Do you even have the knowledge to secure that, right? Oh, there's a lot of OpEx inside of there. Can you do predictive pricing on Amazon? Not really, because how much bandwidth is being used? You know, it goes on and on and on. We built the platform specifically for this in a flat fee, you know, pennies per month, 
you know, to get these things working. And again, we have people that are actually literally taking their things, their prototypes, and having them up and working in a basic communication, you know, in a day, right? So our, our co main competition is do it yourself on Amazon. It's mainly a perceptual thing. Um, IBM has got a huge program with Smart Planet, but that's mainly global services and a PowerPoint, <laughs> it turns out. But they're very smart, you know, and they're out there, and they'll definitely come in and consult you and help you with all of that. You know, that's great. Certainly, uh, Apple's starting to talk about it. You know, they talk about changing the user interface for living. It's pretty cool marketing. I, I'm a little jealous, as a, you know, with my marketing hat on. But um, so they're eventually going to come. Uh, then you have other smaller uh, platforms out there, but all of them are built on Amazon. You know, so hey, you know, there's great things. Most people don't want to focus on the infrastructure, though. They want to focus on the app. You know, the app builder or you know the hardware, their special hardware or some other value add service that you have to have the hardware, the, the infrastructure for. A lot of those people are looking at tying into us because they just don't want to get in that business. We're already in that business. So it's a great, we're kind of the Switzerland of the IoT when it, when it comes to that. All right, so our, our value is, is, much, is pretty high, plus we already have three and a half years experience you know, rolling through, especially from the Patch Bay acquisition. So, um, and then uh, second question again was, oh, wait, competition, how do you keep your competition from jumping on things? Well, you know, there's certainly patent strategies and all of that stuff that you, you keep to go through and protect your IP. But at the end of the day, the, people will come. You know, you build something, if you build it, they will come. You know, it's like competition will come because it's going to be a good idea. You know, other people are going to see it and that is accelerating now, right? The, by the time you go out and have your differentiated message and say, look at me, well, guess what? You just told all your potential competition, look at me. <laughs> you know, it's like, great, they'll come and look at you. It's, it's going to happen. But the whole thing is iterate. Iterate, iterate, stay ahead of it, talk differently about it, tout that next customer win. Nothing goes further than a, a use case, a use study on with a customer. The second you get those, you tout those, and then it becomes real, and then that wheel starts spinning again. Stay ahead on the thought leadership, right? It's, I see, I'm starting to see our stuff, you know, being repeated all over the place. Great, that means I'm on to something, right? Then people understand where they heard it first, and I'm gonna keep iterating on that. My next uh, website major update, uh, or pretty decent updates, November 11th, if I could ever finish the messaging. But uh, I think that's why Janice is really here. She's gonna tackle me afterwards, make me finish the messaging. But um, you know, that's the next step of what's gonna happen out of this, because now we start talking, right now we talk a lot about platforms and stuff like that, but we're spinning into business value, much more about business value instead of just initial platform value. We understand much more about the market. That's the other thing too, you're gonna learn as you get out there so much about what's going on in market. Once you get that, that's going to help you better inform how you talk about these things. You keep that edge of differentiation and how you talk about these things as you learn that, and then the next iteration stays that step ahead as somebody else is still talking about stuff you talked about three months ago. Yes? So, sounds like an infrastructure service plan right now? Uh, platform as a service in a way, yeah. So, um, who owns the data in this, and do you have plans to sanitize and monetize the data that's coming in? Because I think that's huge, huge, huge. Uh, yeah, for, we made a, a concerted decision early on that the data is yours and yours alone. We don't touch it in our service. We'll make our money. You know, we'll make our money on uh, devices and things like that. It's a pretty small charge that we charge, but we're going to make it because we'll have a nice annuity as it builds over time. And we're a public company. You know, we're uh, what our run rate is about 138 million for last year. 200 million in the bank, zero debt. We're public company, you know, it's all on the internet, so you find that. So uh, yeah, we don't have to worry about the next round. You know, we have cash coming in, so we don't have to turn around and do weird things you know, to try and make money. Now, if that data, the data will become valuable over time once it gets to big data, right? It's not a big data yet. It's not gonna be big data for another year, year and a half, something like that, right? It's all little, little data. We like to call it little, little big data. Now, a little data eventually gets to be big data, but it's gonna take a while to get there as more things come on, right? Now, when we get there, if it, there is a market for data, then we'll ask you, hey, we're thinking about opening up a data mart. Would you like to participate and then share revenue with you? But the data is yours. It is completely private from the get-go because it has to be. I can't, you can't trust a company that says, oh, we're going to take your data from this private medical device pump. I mean, you know, I would never put my stuff on that infrastructure without that promise of that privacy level. Right, so we believe the data is yours. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> that's only season one. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. Now in Breaking Bad, 
No. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to talk in the microphone. Which, by the way, was the most perfect ending I've ever seen in a TV show. Oh, I was hoping oh, they'd God. fade to black. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm an ICT for D, and I'm really excited by the combination of this revolution of the cheap, by the way, I love that phrasing, <laughs> with the mixture of IoT. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you kind of see what sort of opportunities you see in actually like developing a world, like not just emerging market, but just least developed countries. Right. Well, it's interesting in, uh, you know, in Africa, there's one, um, God, what's the, uh, I forget which country it's, it is now, it's Nigeria, or I forget, but there's a, you know, it's amazing that cellular technology is actually making its way out there, but it's old clamshells, right? And really, people use the SMS, you know, on that more than anything. Now, in a lot of those uh, areas, you end up having, you know, water is an incredibly valuable thing, and some people walk three hours with water. I don't know, have you guys ever heard of Charity Water? You know, amazing story, right? They're just here at Inbound and stuff. I, if you haven't seen them, look into them. They have a video on that, that kind of story. But, you know, you walk three hours, you know, hot sun and all of that, and you show up and all of a sudden there's a line that's five hours, and that was the situation. You know, and then you get your water, then you gotta walk back two or three hours, and it's night, it's dangerous, you know, all of those things. So what uh, Internet of Things was able to do was tie into those systems, watch the flow monitoring, and then started doing Again, it's a supply chain optimization problem, so it, or pickup optimization problem, and they would actually text based upon the rate of water that was being spent to different areas so that they ended up having a continuous line that was always moving. So you knew that you've walked those two hours, as soon as you got there, the line would just move with you, you got your water, you picked up, and you could turn around and walk right back. So the round trip was four hours, and they knew how far you were coming, so they would ping you at the right time so you could do it during the day. Right, so the amount of people they could actually get through without waiting you know, was huge. And they did it through a very simple thing where they internet connected, actually it was through a satellite connection, these water stations, you know, and people would operate them and they'd watch the rate uh, that would come through and the people that came through and timed that actual schedule just through simple text. Right? That's a powerful thing. You know, and it saves people's lives, makes it a lot easier. You know, man, I can't imagine walking two hours you know, for anything. <laughs> you know, I tried to run the JP Morgan Chase, I thought I was going to die, you know, let alone you know, I'm more a lifting athlete, <laughs> you know, than, uh, you know, than actually, uh, you know, have to walk that far. You know, so there are things, uh, the Uganda Solar Project, actually the solar panels that are out in Uganda through the Notre Dame Project actually power uh, a school, a library, and uh, some of their water stuff, and a couple internet stations, right? So now that whole solar array is helping, you know, kids learn, helping that town. Now, it can't run the whole town, right? but it's actually helping them just in that little area. And then I can remotely be able to, uh, the Notre Dame can actually look at that remotely, see how much power they can learn from that, make it more efficient, all of those things as well. Um, you know, there's a couple great, you know, good examples of how it's helping. But again, it's limitless, really. I mean, you think back to those primitives, what else, you know, can you, can you have? I mean, crop irrigation, those types of things. You know, what if part of your, you know, your property's, you know, super dry, but the other part happens to run right next to an aquifer that you don't even know? You know, do I have to water the whole thing? No, you know, I better have sensors to water when, all of that stuff. I mean, it's incredible what could happen, you know, with all of those things. But those are two cases I, I know off the top of my head. Anybody else? All right, excellent. We're out five minutes early. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate you attending and uh, enjoy some food and go socks.